Hi, Eli the Ecologist here with Fernbank. The following is a compilation of educational nature videos shot both in my backyard and in Fernbank Forest. I hope you enjoy. I want to show you how to identify dogwood trees today using a trick with their leaves. So, there's a couple of species of dogwood trees that are native to Atlanta and to the southeast. You might not be able to differentiate between the species, but you can tell a dogwood from other tree species through this simple trick. Pull off one leaf like this, and inside the veins of the leaves is a milky latex substance in the sap. And this latex will harden when it is exposed to the air. So take the leaf and you want to break it perpendicular to the mid vein. So here's the mid vein. You want to snap it this way. Okay? So tease it apart just slowly and then hold it just a millimeter or two apart while it's separated. Hold it and let that latex harden and look what we get. It's kind of like a little magic trick here. The latex hardens and you have a floating leaf part. Only dogwood trees will do this. So not only can you identify dogwoods by using this trick, you can amaze your, your family and your friends as well. So try this on a dogwood in your yard or maybe the next time you're walking in your neighborhood. To. This is one of the most common tree species in North America, but in Fernbank Forest they happen to reach really exceptional sizes. It's called a loblolly pine, and it's probably, like I said, the most common or one of the most common species in North America. I've heard that the only more numerous species is a red maple, which can be found all the way up to Canada. But loblollies are native to this area. This one is an absolute monster. It's what we call a champion tree, which means it's one of the largest loblollies in all of Atlanta. It's about 138 feet tall and over nine feet in circumference. And the way I can tell it's a loblolly is, well, for one, I can look at the needles. So here's some needles. I'll hold against the white background here so you can see. They're in bundles of three. So three needles are together by this little piece on the end called a fascicle. So they're in bundles of three. And you can also tell by the cones. Let's see if we can find some cones here. Oh yeah, here we go. So this one is kind of partially opened, but they do have very sharp points on the cones. Sometimes they're almost too sharp to handle. But you can see it's not a particularly huge cone, but it's not really tiny either. It's kind of a medium-sized cone as far as uh, pine trees go. But probably about three or four inches long, and they can open and be a little bit wider than this, and they have seeds in there that animals like to eat. Super, super common tree. You might have one in your backyard. You definitely have one in your local park but you might not have one quite as big as this. We've also cored this tree, which we affectionately call corkscrew because it has this funky, twisty shape on its trunk. And this tree is about 160 years old, maybe a little older. So it dates back to around the Civil War. Pretty cool. And uh, I'm just out here checking on the trails today. And while there's not really any human activity, there's certainly some animal activity. And I've got some evidence of one animal I want to show you here. So on the path here, you can see some scat. And I know that this is from a coyote because it's about anywhere from a half inch to an inch in diameter. And it's kind of pointed on the end. It's not really soft like uh, what a dog would leave behind. And it's also full of hair, which is going to be hard to see in this video. Sometimes there's bones, sometimes seeds, especially persimmon seeds. Our coyotes love our native persimmons. And they leave their scat right in the middle of the trail, as you can see here. Boy, 
Christ. I want to take you on a very short wildflower ramble. Let's see what we can find here. Um, see what's blooming in the forest and what might be blooming in your backyard. So our first specimen here is a wild geranium. Beautiful purple flower and you can see the unique shape of the leaves here as well. This is the first one of this sort of cluster that's blooming but we'll get some more out of this. Beautiful five petals, uh, really pretty purple color. Common woodland wildflower. We have a toad shade, or some people call this Sweet Betsy Trillium. And they are generally purple, but sometimes the flowers can be a little bit more greenish or even yellow, but usually you'll see those beautiful sort of maroon colored uh, flowers on the trillium. And all the parts of the plant are in threes, you can see here, the leaves and all the flower parts as well. These are only up for a month or two, and then they go back underground where they have a bunch of stored energy in our root structure, and they'll hang out until about next March, and then they come up again. And they can live for many, many decades. So, leaves of three, let it be. That means don't touch it. But, you might be used to these leaves being green. You can tell when they first leaf out, like this little guy, it's not really all that green. It's kind of purplish, a little brown, very shiny looking, but you can still see the three leaves there that are indicative of poison ivy. Now this is a native vine and it will crawl on the ground. This one is just standing up on its own like a little shrub. It will also climb up trees and it provides flowers that some insects will pollinate and it produces fruit that birds love to eat. But it's probably not something you necessarily want in certain areas of your yard, especially if you have uh, little kids that'll be playing out there. But here in Fernmake Forest, it's perfectly happy. You'll see this sometimes even in the cracks of the sidewalk. And this is a wild violet. This one's purple. You've probably seen a lot of purple violets. There's also white violets. And there are yellow violets. There's many, many different species of violets. And this is a super, super common one little purple. I think this is actually called a confederate violet. Very common woodland plant and also uh, around your neighborhood. I want to introduce you to a very very common plant that some people might call a weed but is a wonderful native plant that's super common. It's found in almost every state in North America and if you have an area where you don't cut your grass and you let it sort of grow wild you'll probably find this plant right now in the springtime, and it's a very important plant to have in our ecosystem. This is called Daisy Fleabane. It has kind of a funny name, uh, but it's in the sunflower family of plants, and the sunflower family of plants has more species than any other plant family in the world, okay? And even this particular type of plant has 400 or close to 400 different species around the world that look like this. Now you might see this and say, you know, this just looks like a weed. I think maybe my parents cut this down when they cut the grass. Well, this is actually a, a good plant you want to keep around if you can because it provides nectar for insects. So there are insects out looking for food. Some of them have been in the ground all winter and they're just emerging and they have maybe a short lifespan and they need to find some nectar. So when they visit these flowers, there's nectar in them right here in the center that provides some nutrition for the insects. And the insects do a favor and actually pollinate these flowers and then they produce seeds. And those seeds can provide food for birds and other animals as well later in the year. So this is called Daisy Fleabane. You can see there's a big stand of it here. And it's super common. See if you can find some in your backyard or somewhere in your neighborhood in the springtime. I've got a, another installment of our series on scat. This wasn't planned, but just happened to, to find another interesting pile of scat left behind by a very charismatic mammal that people love to see in the forest, but it's quite elusive. You don't see it very often. So let's check it out. What we have here is a pile of otter scat. 
And I know it's otter scat because it's very loose, it's kind of mucousy, it smells pretty bad, and it's full of shell pieces, which you might be able to see in the video here, little pieces of shell. And you also see some scales mixed in here as well. So that gives a clue as to what the otters are eating. They're eating little small native fish that we have in the creek and the pond. And they're also eating crayfish or crawfish or crawdads, depending on where you're from. And uh, every once in a while, you'll see their pile like this on the trail or near the pond here in Fernbank Forest.